Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, host of the Better Off Podcast. On today's show, it's tax planning season. Get ready. We've got a special guest. If you could get money into tax-free territory when tax rates are on bargain basement sale prices, now's the time to do it. But be careful. One of the things that came out of the tax law is the repeal of the ability to undo a Roth conversion. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Well, here it is. It's tax time. I'm sorry. Just keeps coming around every single year. Don't freak out too much. I know we're very much absorbed with the changes in the tax code, but most of what is happening will not go into effect until next year at this time. For this year... We have a fabulous guest, Ed Slot. He is a CPA, IRAhelp.com. He's an expert not just in tax planning, but he's also the IRA guru. He'll tell you whether or not to use a Roth versus a traditional. We've been getting a ton of questions on that. And we're also going to talk about how the payroll deductions and withholding has changed and whether or not you need to save a little bit more for taxes next year. Ed Slot's got all the answers, so listen up. Here's our interview. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. Ed Slot, welcome to Better Off. Okay, tax season has opened up. Uh, you look excited. You look caffeinated. I don't know, like you down in some Red Bulls or what's going on for you? This no, is your time, right? No, ta- a lot of tax changes. People have lots of questions and it's great to be back here with you. So let's just talk about, we're talking about 2017, right. no new tax law right. impact yet or some, very few. But what is it about 2017 tax year filing that we need to know? Any changes from the previous year? Well, one good change on medical bills, everything's going topsy-turvy next year. So you have to do planning this year. Obviously, 17 is in the books already. So you can't, unless you had a time machine, you can't go back and change it. But something like medical expenses, they were subject to a 10% limit to go into effect for 2017, but the new tax law went retroactively on that one provision, which was interesting. So now it's back to 7.5%. And what that means is more of your medical deductions will be deductible for 17 and 18. But due to all the gimmicks in the tax law, all these budgetary tricks they did, Mm -hmm. it goes back to 10% in 19. So now we're in 18. We have to like span three years of planning I would try and bunch what you can in this year before the threshold goes up next year and less of your medical will be deductible. So I should get my long-awaited nose job for uh, 2018, put that in the books? Yep, elective Uh, surgery. Okay, let me ask you a question about the medical bills. Do you have to be an itemizer to take that? Yes. So you still are subject to that. So if you don't itemize, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, but remember, this year, many more people are itemizing. When I say this year, when you talk to any tax person, this year means last year. Right. So we're in 2018. But when I say this year, I mean this year's taxes, 2017, that we're working on now. So for 2017 taxes, the people who itemized uh, in the past will probably itemize again. But that may not be true for next year's taxes, meaning 18. Okay. We are not doing April 15th. We're doing April 17th because of the Fakakta Emancipation <laughs> Day, which I find to be a silly thing. Uh, and also, I read on the IRS website that the earned income tax credit, if you uh, do a refund, you are going to get it later. Why is that? I don't know. You know, they're they're so buried trying to implement. They're trying to create withholding tables uh, still based on the new law for the new uh, for employees. And I would be careful, too, if you're getting a salary check. I might stick with the existing withholding tables because the last thing you want is to have less withheld thinking you may be getting a tax cut. You may be paying less. But what if 
especially in the New York area, for example, in high tax states, you're not getting the de- deductions you're counting on. The last thing you want is to owe money. Mm-hmm. So I might be a little careful with those withholding tables. Okay. So besides the date, besides the medical bills and the new withholding, what else do we need to know as we sit down to attack our taxes right now? Well, it depends how you pay taxes. We just talked about employees. They pay taxes through withholding. So that's one area to be careful. But a lot of investors, a lot of people listening here do, or people taking required minimum distributions from IRAs where money is not withheld, they're subject to paying estimated taxes. Again, I would take the safe move and estimate based on last year. You can never get a penalty as long as you paid in at least last year's tax. So I would err if I had to more conservatively that you don't come up short because it's very hard to estimate for next year being 18 taxes because you're comparing apples and oranges, Mm -hmm. two different tax systems now. And so essentially, though, I mean, even if you are in one of those high tax states, coastal states, with, uh, and you're going to lose some of your deductions. If you pay just 100% of what you paid in 17 in 18 is your estimates, right. you're safe. As long as your income is not over 150000 then there's a 110% rule. Okay. So 110% of your taxes. When you're looking ahead at the tax law, we've been getting a bunch of questions. There are some folks who are actually are dropping down into this big fat tax bracket. I love this one. This one the 24%, yeah. 165 to 315. Yeah. Now, we got a call recently of somebody who said, well, that's like a massive range. I stay in it. Is this the year that people should really start to reconsider their Roth? Re- oh, their great Roth. Point. Great they, point. So I want to make it a backdoor, or I want to say, uh uh-uh, uh, you know, I just want to like convert. Let's go. Talk to me yeah. about the Roth. All right. I want to talk about the Roth because there are changes. Uh, The Roth conversion, uh, I'm a big Roth fan. You know why? Because I like tax-free. You know how when financial advisors always tell you, well, probably, maybe, they're always wishy-washy, it could be, depends on... There are certain always rules. At least I have certain non-negotiable rules. Tax-free is always better. Than anything. Right. So that's always. And that's why I'm a big Roth fan, because I'd rather know for sure that in retirement, everything I have will be tax free. And it removes the uncertainty of what future higher taxes, especially when the bill for this new tax bill comes due, could do to your retirement savings. Mm -hmm. So rates are rock bottom. Here's another always rule. Always pay taxes at the lowest rates. Mm-hmm. But that's like saying always buy low and sell high. That's a good one, too. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. Let me try that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's the core of good tax planning, to pay at the lowest rates. Right now, historically, I think rates have hit rock bottom. Wait a minute. Right now, let's just say that again for everyone listening tax rates. The tax rates, I can't see them ever. Look what they had to do to get them down to this level. And for those people that think tax rates are high, think back in the 70s and 80s when the top rate was over 90 percent. Then it went down to 70 percent. And then in the 80s, it dropped down to 50 percent. And the whole country did a happy dance because it was the first time in our lifetimes we were equal partners with Uncle Sam on our own money. And we thought that was fantastic. Right. Now we're down a top rate and you would only hit that a married couple over 600,000 37 percent so now you're talking about that big range the 24 yeah. percent now is the time to strike okay. so back to Roth conversions if you could get money into tax-free territory when tax rates are on bargain basement sale prices now's the time to do it but be careful okay because One of the things that came out of the tax law is the repeal of the ability to undo a Roth conversion. So while I'm a big Roth fan, a big tax-free fan, and I think everybody eventually should have tax-free retirement money by moving it to a Roth, once you convert, you owe the tax bill. There's no going back. So here's my advice. I still like the Roth conversion, but I would wait till after Thanksgiving to do it. Mm. Why? 
because this way you'll have a better picture of your ability to pay the tax, what your own personal tax situation might be. Most of the numbers will be in by then and a good idea of market values. While it's a good move, be careful. And I would not do this without getting professional tax or financial planning advice so you know what the bill will be, but it's still a great move. All right. Now, the other thing you mentioned, the yeah. backdoor Roth. Yep. Now, not everybody, it's interesting in the tax law, you wonder how these things come to be. Yeah. There is no income limit on who can convert. If you had a billion dollars, you can convert it. And it's, But that gets added to your taxable income. Yeah, that's right. Okay. But low rates. But let's yeah. say, but the, the funny part about the tax code, the, or the illogical part, to convert, and that's where all the big money is. People can convert tens, hundreds right. of thousands. There's no income limit. But if you want to make a $5,500 contribution, that's where they draw the line. Yeah, right. <laughs> now there's income limits. Okay. So not everybody can make a Roth contribution. So we're talking about two different flavors of Roths. The conversions, which we just talked about, yep. and the contributions, which are limited to only 5500 a year, unless you're 50 or over, 6500 So if you're over those limits, and for 2018, they're high limits. Uh, for example, if you're married joint and your income is under 189000 you can do the full Roth. And uh, if you're single, under 120000 you can do the full Roth. Okay. But let's say your income is above that. You can't do the fifty-five or $6,500 Roth. There's something that's been called. It's not in the tax code. They would never call it that in the tax code. The first time I ever heard about it was from you. Right. The backdoor Roth. So because there's no income limits on traditional IRAs, that you could you could actually contribute to a traditional IRA, a non-deductible one, and then convert that to a Roth. Some people in the years past were skeptical if this was this workaround was even legal. I'm here to tell you it's absolutely legal. Has it been challenged? It, it doesn't have to be because in the conference committee reports to the new tax law, although this is not in the new tax law, they mentioned four times that this is absolutely legal and doable. Okay. So no income limit. I put money into my traditional IRA. And then when do but I actually- But not everybody can do it. Because the traditional IRA has other restrictions. For example, you cannot make a contribution to a traditional IRA if you're over 70 and a half. Okay. So this doesn't work for people over 70 okay. and a half. So and you still have to have the earnings. To okay. Be... So you have no income limit. You have to be under 70 and a half. You have to earned income, right. not passive income. Right. Now, presuming I get that and I don't qualify for a Roth, I put my money into a non-deductible IRA. Right. At what point do I have to then convert it into a Roth? You could do it the next second. Okay. We used to say give it a waiting period because the law wasn't clear. Now we don't have to even wait. Somebody had asked me, when are we going to wait for IRS to rule on it? They don't have to. They only rule when Congress's intent is not clear. Their intent is clear now. Why is there so much craziness around? If the, there is this workaround, why yeah. not just open up the Roth to everybody? Right. Well, that's my point. For, that you can convert hundreds of thousands, if not millions, without any of this. But if you want to make a $5,500 contract... I don't know. It's okay, good. and there's also this other permutation of like a care factor that we need to think about. And that is if you have an existing IRA account, right? And you want to do a backdoor Roth. Explain what happens then. All right. If you have an existing, I hate to throw this at you, but why not? If you do, if you have, I asked for it, baby. Yeah. Give it to me. <laughs> if you have an existing Roth IRA, uh, if you want to, if you have an existing traditional IRA, now you make this contribution non-deductible, and you want to convert it to the Roth, a good part of that may be taxable. Let, let, let's start from ground zero. If you, if you don't have an existing traditional IRA and you just make this uh, non-deductible contribution, you can convert it tax-free. Easy. Right. But if you have existing IRA balances, there's something called a pro rata rule, oh. which, mean, which means there's a percentage of each dollar you convert that will be taxable and tax-free. How much is tax-free? You have to go through your IRA now and see the amount of your non-deductible or after-tax money in your IRA over the balance in all of your IRAs, including SEP and simple IRAs. So it's a little calculation. If you have a good tax preparer, 
preparer. The, the uh, software does it automatically, and you report that on Form 8606 with your taxes. I love that you, you asked for, for it. I know. I love that. So <laughs> if you have an existing IRA, right. is it just easier for – you can convert a little bit at a time, right? right? You don't have to do that well, all at once. Well, that's another point I would want to make. Like if you're not sure – remember I said you're not sure if you can pay the tax. Uh, one thing that – this is a common question I get. People think when I talk about Roth, you have to convert everything. You can do partial conversions. And my advice for people who are not sure but want to get to that – great place of having tax-free retirement income, why don't you start an annual series of smaller Roth conversions each year, staying in these low brackets, Mm -hmm. and over time, you'll be taking down your taxable exposure and building up your tax-free retirement income. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with Ed Slot in just a minute, but I really want to spend some time on why you are paying too much money in taxes. That's Ed's area of expertise, but it may be as a result of your investing strategy. That's why I'm so happy that our sponsor is Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Not only is Betterment service designed to help improve your long-term returns, It may also help to lower your taxes. The reason is Betterment has tax saving strategies that may be able to increase your after tax returns. Everything Betterment does is designed to lower taxes and increase returns. And whenever you save money in taxes, the coolest part about that is tax savings just flows to your bottom line. And that is a beautiful thing. For more on how you may be able to improve your tax situation, go check out Betterment. Go to Betterment.com slash better off. Betterment, rethink what your money can do. And now back to our interview with Ed Slot. So we have a ton of listeners who are self-employed. Yeah. And they have uh, or they've got some side hustles, a little gig right. stuff. It would seem to me that this whole pass-through thing oh, God. is a I, nightmare. Yeah, it is I, a hellish nightmare. I was nightmare. hoping you weren't going to say those words. I know, hellish nightmare. <laughs> um, and and the re- not the pass-through. Not the pass-through. <laughs> so without going too deep into the weeds on All this, right. the general concept that we ha- had been operating under is that you've got a pass-through entity. A pass-through, it's whether you're a sole proprietor, you make some money, You've got a LLC, you've got an S Corp, whatever that thing is, it, it passes through that entity. It's now taxable to you at whatever your personal tax rate is. Okay. So that seems easy because that was sort of how it was. And your personal tax rate could be lower this year anyway. Right. So then we find out that I guess because the corporate tax rate went from 35 to 21 percent, that people said, well, what What about me? me?" Even the people teaching this, CPAs and tax courses that CPAs go to, they're not sure about how it's going to play out. But the general rule is if you're an employee, you can't make your, I mean, you could, but it won't work if you try and make yourself an independent contractor and say, now give me the tax break, this 20 percent reduction. Because you're doing the work. It's almost like an anti-worker thing. If you were managing 20 people, then you might get that break, but you'd still have to be under certain income limits. So let's just let's give a good example. Let's say that I'm a CPA yeah. and I have an LLC, Jill Schlesinger CPA, and it's an LLC. I am a single, I just, I work out of my house. You, I you just probably I do won't taxes get it because you're personally involved. You're actually getting your hands do, yes, uh, dirty. Yes, I'm doing all the work. And right, see that's that's what gets me about this. The, the, it's almost like an anti-worker thing. The the harder you work, the less the benefit. Okay, so what happens under the new rules for? Let's just. I'm going to give you uh, basic. I make five hundred grand a year as yeah, a no, CPA. You're out. Yeah. At all, I get nothing. Like what? Right. No, that, the, the income limits are, are, I forget what they are, but- uh, I think 315 yeah, something or something like that. Like that. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're above that, you, you don't even get, get it. You don't as get, far as I understand, you don't get it. 
because it goes back to zero. It, you know, in other words, many of the no, no, tax it's not breaks that, that you, you don't get, get the twenty percent reduction. That's what we're talking okay. about. Okay, so what do you? You get? still pay at your personal rate. You just pay at your personal right. rate, but you don't get the big drop. Right now, compare unless that unless you were. Remember, this was meant for the big corporations who are generally C corporations yep. that get the benefit. And the big mistake I think people are going to make that see this, they're going to go to their accountant, but most accountants know not to do this, and say, make me a C corporation. You don't want that because you still have to get the money out. Yeah. You're still subject to a possible double tax. That's a trap. Which is the whole point of being a pass-through. Right. Right. Okay. So if I'm now, if I am a CPA and I'm doing the work, and then I have uh, 10 people working for me, and I don't do the work anymore. Well, then, okay, yeah, if you're right? running an entity. Yeah, I'm right. running the organization. Right, but again, you know, the way I understand it, and it's a little ambiguous still, and and even the tax writers are trying to come up with some rules that people can understand, mm-hmm. it appears you don't get it if your income is still over those levels. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I have a, um, let's, let's do a, a fun exercise. Let's say that there's a person who, because um, I understand that there's some, there's exemptions for engineers and architects for some, uh, yeah, whatever. You, okay. Anything to do with real estate exactly. got exempted. Exactly. You, you went. <laughs> uh, let's just say that you're somebody who creates content, like a podcast person, like someone who might look like the person you're sitting across <laughs> from. And let's just say that I claim I am doing the work. However, I'm a manufacturer. Ah, I am a manu- okay. I manufacture the, content. You just hit the magic word. So what I'm going to call myself now is a content manufacturer. What do you think? Then I think you you're think okay. that's aggressive, though. Yeah, but again, this going to this is going to lead. You know, I heard somebody use this phrase, a CPA of all thing, an orgy of tax avoidance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because and 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 as it should, because it's silly yeah. the way it's written. It's completely silly. Yeah. Okay, for those who are self-employed, you can still put money away into your retirement account. It's a yeah. great way to reduce your taxable income. But even there. There's less of a benefit because rates are generally lower. That's why if you uh, if you could do anything, do the Roth. While rates are lower, putting into tax-free vehicles are better because even with your 401k, if you're a worker, the deduction you're getting for the 401k is not worth as much as what you may be paying on the back end. So I tell everybody, if you can, lose the deduction. Give it up because it's not worth as much when rates are low and go with a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k at work and build a tax-free savings account. I love that. We always get the question about, should I do the Roth and not? And I say, I quote Ed Slot, and I say, <laughs> hey, you know what? You make too much money to open up a Roth. Use the Roth 401k because there's no income restriction on right. that, right? Uh, let me just get back to my, just the, the, because I know we have small business owners who listen okay, and we get a lot good. of these questions. So, But, my, but, but even with the small business owner, first fill up your own Roth. You can still do 5,500. You know, most people don't even fill the 5,500. That's a gimme, unless they're over the income limits. Right. But a lot of small businesses aren't. Exactly. Can I deduct my business expenses if I'm a small business? Yes. But not if I'm a regular schnorrer yeah. worker. See, this is the hierarchy we created. I hate to be, and I want to be political, but it's just be it. the, <laughs> Do the it. facts. Uh, we've created this higher, almost, uh, what's the opposite? A lower arc. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a race to the bottom. Right. So on the bottom of who benefits from the tax, other than the rates, which everybody benefits from, if you're a worker, an employee, you get nothing. It's all fully taxable income. You can't deduct your work-related expenses. I had the mailman come into our office when this was going on, and he says, oh, I hear it's pretty good. Uh, and I told him all the things you don't... He said, what about my union dues? No, that's out. What about my uniforms? What about my travel? What about my work? All out, because he's an employee. Uh-huh. That section of the tax return repealed. So for workers, they pay through the nose. It's all pure income without those big work-related deductions. If you had unreimbursed employee business expenses right. where you're traveling around, people sometimes have thousands in deductions there because they're not reimbursed. Mm-hmm. That's all out. Mm. So that's the, the lowest level of who doesn't benefit other than the general benefit of the rates. Then you go up one notch from there, the self-employed person, where if they have a business entity, like the pastor or whatever their entity is, they do get those business-related deductions. Mm-hmm. And then you have the level up from that 
self-employed person to the person you were talking about, the manufacturing, the bigger entity mm -hmm. that can get maybe that pass-through tax break. Right. And then you have the big corps that get the huge breaks. And then you have the people, uh, the investors that get the capital gains breaks because those rates are the same. But uh, for example, on uh, long-term capital gains, a married couple could have up to 77,000 of long-term capital gains. And you know what rate they pay? Zero. Zero. And then you have the people at the very top who benefit most. So we went from the people who do the, do the most work. Now we're up to the investors who I don't want to say don't do work, but it's passive income. It's not labor work. And we used to make a distinguishing decision between capital and labor. Right. And it was definitely... It was clear, and now it seems to have it's been It's money, flipped. but it's still you know, the bigger benefits are the capital. So uh, for the stock, if you're collecting interest and dividends, you, you're almost at the top of this hierarchy. But there's one group that's at the very top. Real estate. No. Oh, well, that too. <laughs> People that don't do any work at all. Heirs. People who inherit it all free. <laughs> I mean, well, not all for a married couple, 22.4 tw million, which covers 99.99% of the people. So if you inherit and do nothing, no work at all, they not only get free estate tax, but unlimited step up in basis. So I no don't get that. I don't get they that. They get it all. So if you're at the top of the hierarchy and those are the people that don't have to do anything but collect, it's all free. Ed, um, the best thing about the new tax uh, system and the worst thing. All right. The best thing are the low rates, the high standard deduction, the simplicity. There is some simplicity. Got to give them that because most people will be taking uh, the standard deduction of 24000 a couple, 12000 singles because most people just don't have that much in deductions. Uh, they won't have to do as much record keeping. Uh, I just talked before about the employees that, you know, used to we told them, keep your Seats. Every time you met a client here right. and went there, or not client because you're a worker, but you had to go here, your salesman here, uh, your union dues, work related, all that's out. So it's out, but it's being replaced with a, a bigger standard deduction. Hopefully that's enough for you. If it's not, then you're still behind the eight ball and people say, I'd rather have it complicated and more deductions. All right. So but what... it is simplified in that respect. So the worst part of the new tax plan. Well, if you have a lot of kids that are over 17, you don't get the exemptions anymore. Uh, there is a child credit, but under 17, and that's a pretty good credit, $2,000 credit of mm -hmm. which 1400 is refundable. There's some people in high tax states that may be paying more. How do you feel about that? Well, some people say, <laughs> people in New York at high tax state, and when it was being, call, being called tax reform, they said, no, it's tax revenge. <laughs> well, it does feel that way. And I just want to point out something that's interesting. The reason why I said, how do you feel about that is an anchor uh, on a radio station in Texas said to me, well, why should I, as a citizen of the United States... Well, now How, I'm a, a New York resident, okay. so you're going to okay. get me. So I'm going to. So I want to hear. I'm a. I'm a taxpayer of the United States. Why should I have to pay for the fact that your state is poorly run? Can because you please we, hold up? Hold up. Wait a second. <laughs> now, everybody, listen up here. Here's what you say to your friends in low tax and no tax states. Go ahead. Because New York, my state. Now you may be in a state like California. That's the same thing. Is something called a donor state. A lot of our taxes go to states like Texas, like Florida, that have no state tax because they need money. There is a trade-off there. It's around 70 percent. Uh, the money we pay, uh, only about 70 percent comes back to us. The rest goes help to other people where they don't have the tax base. Screw you, Texas. Okay, sorry. Ed Slot, thank you. I didn't say that. That I know. was Jill. I Jill love on Texas. money. That's who said that. That's right. Uh, don't mess with Texas. I know. Uh, <laughs> hello, my friends in Texas. Love you, KRLD. Uh, Ed Slot, thank you so much. If you would like more on IRAs, taxes, and all things Ed, go to IRA Help dot com i r a help dot com and uh, you still got the newsletter right yeah that's what professional advisors yeah but we but got there's... a lot of advisors listening okay. uh, so yeah. if you're a professional advisor you may want to check it out uh ed thanks for taking time out of your very busy day bringing your delightful daughter <laughs> who's not a cpa but i think that maybe she's learned from the best that she doesn't have <laughs> thank to be you. Thank, thank you thank you very much you're listening to better off with jill schlesinger 
it is time for the listener question of the week. Remember, every week after we do the interview, unless we I go too long, and that happens every so often, uh, we put you on the air with me. This listener question of the week is an important way for me to figure out what's going on in your financial life and how to help you out. And then we also actually drop a bonus call of the week on Tuesday. So twice every week, you've got a shot to talk to us. And, you know, us is me, Jill Schlesinger, a certified financial planner, in fact, the senior CFP board ambassador, and Mark, who is studying very hard right in the middle of estate planning uh, for his CFP certification, whether or not he sits for the test, we don't know, but he just wants to make himself smarter about this stuff. So if we don't know the answer, we'll find out the answer for you. But give us a holler. We'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at betteroffpodcast.com. This morning, we're talking to Brian in Seattle. And uh, Brian, welcome to the program. What can we do for you? Uh, I'm 53, single, no kids. And I've got a $100,000 inheritance. And I've got a mortgage at one sixty, and I've got 10 years left on it. It's... 2.85, 2.85, and I owe 60 on it now, and I make 95 a year, max out my Roth and my 457, and I'll get a pension probably about 3000 a month. And I've got an emergency fund of 25000 and just trying to figure out if I should just go and pay it off or put it elsewhere. Well, Brian, so you're 53, so you're a young guy. Tell me, in, in in your hope of hopes, when would you like to retire? What's your game plan? Probably 65. Okay, so we've got 12 more years, right? And for you, the the payoff of the mortgage, even though it's a 2.85% note, it is for what? Just because you're like, ugh, I hate it, I don't want it? What, what's the rationale? Uh, just peace of mind. I, I hate that. And do you have any money that is in, you said you've got retirement accounts, right? A, a Roth IRA and a Section 457 plan. Anything else besides that that's not in retirement? Nothing. nothing. Okay. So, and you said, um, I just want to make sure I got that. The pension that you will receive, that three grand a month, will that basically cover your needs? Yeah, I have uh, no expenses at all. Okay. Right now, how much money is in the Roth? How much is in the 457? Uh, Roth is about 150 and 457 about 280. So you're in great shape. And, and how much time is left on that mortgage pay down? You said there's 60 grand left on that note, right? Yeah. How many years left till, you, till it's paid off? Uh, 10 years. I want to tell you not to pay it off, okay? But I hear that it's bugging you. So, uh, hmm. Okay, here's your, the two basic choices. If you were to pay off the 2.85% note, which is like really such a low interest rate, it's hard for me to even say it out loud, you would simply be doing it, as you said, for peace of mind. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I would even think about it as saying, uh, with 10 years left, you would be essentially getting a slightly better return on a 10-year safe bet than the U.S. Treasury, right? Because a a 10-year, actually, it's exactly the same. A 10-year Treasury right now is about 2.8%. Your mortgage is 2.8%. It would be a push, basically, Uh, meaning that it wouldn't matter either way whether you did that or bought a bond. So if you could stomach it, knowing that you only have 10 years left, and you use the $100,000 to essentially build a nice, low-risk non-retirement account, that would probably be better. Um, and and maybe it would be something like, uh, you know, some index funds, some index stock funds, some index bond funds that really wouldn't be touching this for a bunch of years. And then you would be done with the mortgage in 10 years when you're still working. Once that mortgage is done with, which, as you said, I mean, you could always pay it off if you're freaking out. But I'm not sure why you'd pay it off if you don't really need that peace of mind right this second, because you're working still and you can afford it and you're saving and everything is good. So, I mean, if you just can't stand having it, I guess, fine, pay 60 grand down. You've got the cash. Use the other 40 to start that fund of 
kind of, let's call it your extra non-retirement asset fund or a general investment account. That's fine. But I don't know how much it really bugs you, but if it really bugs you, you're going to do it anyway. So that's fine. It's better for you financially, probably not to pay it off. So okay. what do you think? Yeah, sounds good to me. All right. So so take a deep breath. If you can bear it, keep it. Start a nice, boring general investment account. Maybe keep a little money in cash in case you change your mind for some reason, but you've got that money in an emergency reserve fund. So I think that you don't have to pay it off. So if you can bear it, just hang in there. You're going to be you're going to be good. You're in great financial shape. So congratulations. You have absolutely positively, you know, smashed any of the savings myths of of somebody who is 53 years old and makes 100 grand a year or 95 grand a year. You've saved beautifully. So congratulations. All right. Thank you, Jill. All right. Take care. Well, that's it. That's the show. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got any questions or need more information, go to JillOnMoney.com. You can sign up for our new newsletter. want to thank Ed Slot. He's always fabulous when it comes to tax preparation. And also to our caller, Brian. Don't forget, we drop new episodes of the show every Tuesday and Thursday. You can download us anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, or you can go to JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Our executive producer is Mark Talercio, the best producer in the world. We're distributed by Cadence 13, and we're sponsored by Betterment. See you next week.